Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And uh, thanks again for joining us on the Page One Podcast where we talk to writers of all kinds, comic book writers, authors, screenwriters, video game writers, about their writing techniques, their process and their work and just learn about how they got into the industry to try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. I hope you're all doing okay this week. We're thinking particularly of uh, our friends in America and listeners in America with all the horrible news that's coming out of America at the moment. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, we at Right Gear are very much on the side of the protesters um, and we hope everyone's okay and that there can be some movement forward with all that. It is quite a horrible time in the world right now with the pandemic and everything going on. So yeah. not, not the nicest time. No, it, it would be it would be good if there could be some good news coming coming out at some yeah. point. <laughs> be a nice change for twenty twenty. Yes, definitely. Um, but we hope that the podcast can serve as as a little bit of a a distraction from from all of that horrible news at the moment. And we do have a really good and interesting guest on the podcast this week. Yeah, this week we have Alexandra Sokolov. She's a screenwriter and an author. Uh, she's written a number of books. Her Huntress series of books are probably her best-known fictional books. Uh, they're based on real-life serial killer cases. But um, aside from the fictional stuff, she does a lot of screenwriting uh, how-to books, which she's very well known for. Stealing Hollywood, perhaps mm-hmm. you might have heard of. Uh, yeah. So we, we have a chat with her about that. Yeah, and she, she also like teaches to you know small groups and very, very large groups, as we hear, this technique because um, she used to work in screenwriting, she was a reader for studios, and so she really picked up what the technique in screenwriting is and then realised that that was something that she could bring into novel writing as well and follow that sort of similar structure. And when she speaks about it, it's something that suddenly strikes you as quite obvious in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. Um, but Mm -hmm. you can see it running through so many books that you read and movies that you watch, that, that same sort of structure and in a story to drive it forward yeah and it's it's a very good tool that anyone really can learn i think mm-hmm. and anyone can apply to their work in progress and it's like most stuff i think you kind of realize is the books and films that, that you enjoy reading are the ones that do have a very well thought out structure mm-hmm. that follows all the the kind of classic ups and downs so she, it's a really really good chat lots of really really good tips yeah, so it's a really great episode, so we won't delay it any longer. Uh, just before we go into it, there'll be a brief uh, little advert for our writer's notebook that we've designed that can help you plan your story, maybe with some of uh, Alexandra's techniques. Uh, and then after that, we'll get straight into the podcast, and we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know who's who's on the podcast next week and a bit more about our new project, which is the Page One Sessions. See you then. The Blank Page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. 
And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project. Whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Was writing always your ambition when you were when you were younger? It was not, not at all. I never thought that I would be a writer. Um, I was a theater kid, and and I mean, I was always writing. I did scads of journals. I read constantly, so I was getting all that background that you need as a writer. Mm. Those are the two things that you need to do constantly. But but I was really into acting and and dance especially singing musicals um and theater is really great training for writing because you are up in front of a live audience that gives you instant feedback about mm -hmm. character about plot points about story arcs about suspense you know you you know right there if you're doing it right or not um and i very early on got into the big picture i started directing <laughs> Actually, I started directing when I was 10 or 11 years old. We nice. would put on plays in our, in our friend's uh, garage <laughs> and we charged money for it. So, so I always thought I could make a living <laughs> in my young mind. Um, but uh, now that takes, that takes some hubris, I think. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, so, so we did that. Um, but I did. I started directing when I was still in high school because I loved the big picture of it. Mm -hmm. And from directing, it's not a big step to writing. Mm -hmm. So all through university, and I went to Berkeley, um, we were doing theater all the time. And I directed a lot. And I started writing uh, for classes. And a one-act play that I had written got produced. And I saw my characters walk out on stage and I was just hooked. That yeah. was just a shot of God <laughs> to the <laughs> veins. Um, so that's when I became a writer. Writer, yeah. That 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 must have been amazing. Yeah, to see your what was in your head come to life in front of you is is always a great it is experience. It I is. think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and after, I think I'm right in saying after college, uh, amongst other things, you became a screenplay reader for various studios in Hollywood. Is that right? That's right. Um, I was I went to university in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and we had a theater group after college, um, and we were actually starting to make money at it. But we were doing political theater in Berkeley, which <laughs> the idea that we could make money off of that, and I didn't want to work at a day job, so. I very naively thought, well, you know, I'll just go down to Los Angeles and, and write for movies, <laughs> just like that. But, but that's pretty much what happened, because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, when you, uh, the reading story analyst uh, job is what everybody does to be a screenwriter in Hollywood, unless you have, even if you do have um, relatives who are the, the heads of movie studios, which a lot of people do start that way. The best way to break into Hollywood is is to be born into it. Um, but uh, there's no way that you can't run into people who can get you jobs as a reader. It's um, You have to read really fast, you have to write really fast, and it's excellent training, mm -hmm. not just for the craft of screenwriting, um, which is really different from writing plays, but I did have that foundation. And um, it also introduces you to all the key players. You mm -hmm. get to know all of the agents and their tastes and their client list. So at the same time that I was doing that, I was writing a script with a partner. And when we had one that we knew was really great, um, and we did that through a writing group, we had lots of feedback on it. We knew we had a great script. and. Um, I knew exactly who to call and I could just say I was a reader at this company and that company and I knew their clients work from this and nobody said no, mm -hmm. nobody did. So 
it was a combination of working it and uh and doing the research brilliant no but i can see that that is uh i mean actually what you say about about breaking into hollywood it is it is a, a difficult step you know if, if you're a, if you're wanting to write screen plays in the uk i think and you have this ambition of making a film in hollywood it's so so far away even if you write the greatest thing in the world to actually yeah. be able to get get it over there and get it in front of the right people and get them to look at it and all that sort of thing well you guys in and i know the uk industry is really different i wouldn't even begin to in, even in scotland it's different from down mm-hmm. in london i've gone to some of those um seminars and i have friends who work in the industry and i still don't understand how any of it works but i have to say in hollywood especially being at a distance it would be better for you to write books first Mm -hmm. because uh, and i'm not saying this anecdotally like because it was better for me i'm saying it because i also was on the board of directors of the writers guild the screenwriters union for two years and every single month at those meetings, we saw the stats of what got sold and what, you know, what properties got sold and who sold it and who bought it and what, how much. It is much easier to sell a book mm-hmm. to Hollywood than scripts. They would much rather buy a book because there's more there. Mm-hmm. And it comes usually with an audience already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about writing a script, write the book first and then if you started it with a script, you have the book and the script and you can go from there, but it's, it's just far easier to sell a book. Mm-hmm. And, and it's funny because you, so you kind of went from the opposite way then you, you started off in the screenplay world, then you, you went into the book world after that. And, yeah. and you also did, am I right in saying you did, you, in between that, you, you went into the kind of teaching world as well. And you, you taught a lot um, of all the, the tips and tricks you'd learned in the, the screenwriting world. Right. Well, the minute I, I didn't do that when I was a screenwriter, I was too busy. Um, but <laughs> I mean, because you work on three projects at a time, sometimes they're always mm. in different stages of development. It's, it's grueling that way. But when I sold my first book, um, and I got on that circuit, the writing circuit, that there is one here too, that you go to these conferences and you, you, um, you start talking in front of no one wants to hear screenwriters talk (laughs) nobody ever asks you (laughs) to talk to people Um, but writers want to hear from other writers to maybe learn something um so everybody was asking me because i did come from screenwriting to teach screenwriting classes to novelists and i said no way because most of those conferences were not in los angeles and just like I'm saying to you, if you're in Los Angeles, then you can have a screenwriting career. But if you're not, you should be writing novels uh-huh. um, unless you're you guys are young. So it's different. You could move to L.A. No problem. <laughs> the accents are done far, I'm telling you. But but <laughs> most people that they wanted me to talk to were never going to have Hollywood careers. Uh-huh. And it would be a liability for them to write a script of their book really so i said i won't do that but you know writers could learn a lot from the story structure and the visual storytelling techniques of film and i'd be happy to teach that so it was a great way the u.s doesn't pay at all of the conferences the way that they do over here in the uk authors get paid to appear Mm -hmm. here it's great you guys actually value the arts in the U.S., not so much. Um, so it was a great way for me to pay for those conferences. People would pay me to go. Mm-hmm. And it was just a nice little side income. And also I started teaching to bigger and bigger crowds, like sometimes eight or 900 people wow. oh, at wow. a time, which is great, you know. Um, so, and I enjoy it. It's, I love talking about movies. Who doesn't? Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's why I think it's a great way for authors to learn any kind of storytelling because we have all seen so many movies in common yeah. and can talk yeah. about those. I talk about Jaws. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You can call up those scenes and yeah. it's just a shortcut to learning story. Mm-hmm. 
So and I, th I think that's so true. I think everybody, even subconsciously, will take in so much stuff from a film and they'll, be, they'll have films that they know they enjoy and films that they know they don't. And even if they don't understand why, you know, they can they can learn easily what, what the reason for a film not working for them was and Absolutely. take that from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what would be, if you were to give a couple of key tips that you think authors could learn from screenwriting, what, what would be your top tips? Well, the the main two and and let me look what you want to do is go to my new youtube channel because i've started doing this on on video um nice but but what i'm trying to get across and the main things are first of all um and this isn't one tip it's the entire secret movies are written in a three act eight sequence structure um a two hour movie is going to have eight 15 minute sequences and there's a really strong historical reason for that which was film reels right there were 15 minutes on a reel and you didn't want the reel cutting out in halfway oh, through it I, did, I had no idea about that well no i but it's so simple right yeah. so Next time you watch a movie, look for the 15 minute sequences, mm -hmm. because even though we don't put things on film reels anymore and you wouldn't necessarily have to have that that designation, it happened for so long that it sort of sunk in. And then what happened in the 50s that would really lock that structure in 15 minutes and then a break and 15 minutes and then a break. What was the technology that happened then? The new medium. TV, TV. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Television and ads, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you had even less. Oh, of course. Of right. Of course. Right. Yeah. So, not only th it wasn't like you had them captive in a movie theater; they could change the channel at that ad break if they didn't like what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So people started writing to act climaxes or sequence climaxes every 15 minutes. And we know that rhythm so well, all of us, all of us, that if you as a writer aren't doing that, people are going to think you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. They will get restless and they'll wonder where that big, big climax is. Mm -hmm. They will. So you need to know that and write to it. Um, and you can see it in books, too. And you can see where you drop off in a book if in a 400-page book, every 50 pages or so, you're not coming to a big mm -hmm. climax that then goes on to a separate sequence that advances the story in some other way and, and probably gives you a change of location and direction. Mm -hmm. We're so used to seeing it. Yeah. And it, so that's what I teach. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it is, as Tarek was saying as well, is it's something that is subconscious to a lot of people. But when you, as you say, when you stand back and analyze it, you can, you can start. I, yeah. I'm already thinking of things that, that do exactly that sort of. Yeah, that that's really interesting. I, I imagine I think the next film I watch, I'm going to consciously look for that now and, and see, because I can totally, that makes total sense. And yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, when you moved from, um, writing screenplays into books um first of all what what made you make that that jump into into writing novels um well that's complicated but uh, it was um because i was on the board of directors i was seeing a lot of changes in the industry that were not good for screenwriters mm. and one of them was reality tv um, but also, uh, we used to get paid when I started writing, you would get paid usually for three drafts, not, not necessarily full draft, but a draft, a set and a polish, a set of revisions and a polish. So not the same amount of money for all of those things, but you would be guaranteed to be paid those three steps. And if they fired you, which often they did, they go on to a new screenwriter, like toilet mm -hmm. paper, really. yeah. but um, literally. Oh, no, toilet paper is now very, very much. We have more valuable than all those things. What screenwriters were treated as. But um, yeah, they, even if they fired you, you'd still get those 
three sets of payments and health insurance and the whole bit. Mm -hmm. So you could make a great living. And then some brilliant executive figured that there were so many people who wanted to be screenwriters that they didn't have to pay us like that. <laughs> um, so what happened instead of getting paid for three drafts, you would get paid for one draft and have to do 17 or 18 in a, in a more cutthroat, you know, competitive environment. And I thought, in, and, and statistically, here I am a woman, um, 20% of, of the jobs come to women. Mm -hmm. The rest, 80% were to men at the time. It's gotten not much better. Everybody thinks that, oh yeah, every everything's changed now, but you look at the stats and it's not mm -hmm. any more than a couple of percent. Yeah. So, so those were not good. And I was also just, I, I kind of snapped. I just, I just wanted to do something that nobody would tell me how to fix it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I got the rights back to one of my scripts. Um, and even though I was working on a movie at the, at, during the day, I would come back. And even if I had time just to write a paragraph, I would write a paragraph. And I'm like, I'm going to write a book. Um, and I wasn't thinking of making a jump. I was just thinking I wanted to do one thing mm -hmm. that was mine. Um, and... So that's the book that sold and they gave me a two book deal. And then when I realized I could make an, an equivalent living, basically doing something that made me free, feel like I'd been let out of prison, that was a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how it happened. It was a lateral move over into a different medium that I had a lot more control over. And it's, it's the way you approach writing a book similar to the way you, you approached working on, on, on your scripts? Because I think I read in an interview that you gave to someone else that you you really enjoy the planning part of it. And and that's and, and the, the first draft is the kind of slog part, but the redrafting and the planning is the part that you enjoy. And is that was that similar to when you're doing scripts as well? Is that the kind of stuff you really are drawn to? Well, I guess um, a first draft of a book is like a full script. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the finished product of a script is your starting point is my starting point is the first draft and my first drafts kind of look like scripts they're not they're very bare bones they're little more than an, a very extended outline mm -hmm. um but then in a book where where if you're working on a movie you hand it off to a director and they start making all the fun decisions <laughs> um uh, as an author you get to direct onto the page mm -hmm. And that was really exciting to me that I, I knew that I could get the bare bones down the outline, but to be able to fill in every color of it, to fill in the actors' performances and, and fill in the set design and fill in the music score, basically, because you have to do the emotion and the, the suspense of things and the exhilaration of things and designing the set pieces, the big scenes, all of that was, um, those are my different layers after I have a first draft. So that to me is the fun part because it's the directing part mm -hmm. and the acting. And one thing that other authors have sort of griped about a bit that we've spoken to is when they get their notes back from their editor and you know, do they sit on them? Do they agree with them? Do they not agree with them and stuff? But I imagine coming from a screenwriting background, you're much more used to um, having having input from other people and saying, no, fix this, fix that, fix that. So it, it might actually be easier getting notes when you've had that in your background. I've never had a bad note from an editor, not once. I don't know what people are talking about. They should have had <laughs> one, one development meeting. They would have a bad note. You know? I, I just, uh, people in publishing actually read, they actually have a sense of story and they might not be, you know, you might get someone who says, they can pinpoint that there is a problem somewhere. They don't know how to tell you what it is. But as long as you're listening to something didn't work in that chapter, then you're going to find what they're talking about and you will be able to fix it. I just, there's, I'm sure that there are a couple out there that are bad eggs, but in general, absolutely not. And, mm -hmm. and in, in screenwriting, everybody has conflicting notes and there's a lot of ego involved of just wanting to 
I mean, people really literally try to shoehorn their latest affair into things or, you know, oh no, we're, we're pregnant. And now wouldn't it be interesting if he had a mistress and the mistress was pregnant? Yeah. Like <laughs> you think we don't understand why you want to see this storyline. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And well, I suppose just, with, go ahead. Well, sorry. I suppose with, with screenwriting, when, when you get notes back is there's also more factors going into it, like the cost of a scene or the setting sure. of a scene or too many characters that you can't you don't want to pay for etc whereas i suppose in the book it's literally as you say you are doing you're doing the heavy lifting completely yourself and you can have as many locations and characters as you want there's no cost difference i'm glad you said that we have an unlimited production budget as as authors we have unlimited power to do anything that we want it's it's an incredible feeling that you can do literally anything location. Yeah. So yeah, it's great. It's a great freedom. And I don't think that authors take advantage of that often enough. And and when you when you're doing so you, you do a sort of very rough uh, first draft, as you said, a sort of largely a, a bigger outline and then build on that in the redrafting process. But uh, how many drafts do you typically do of a of a book before you you then submit it or publish it or i do tons but but i think of it more as layers because a draft will be like with, with i have a my new series is is multi characters i mean really multi characters um and so you can take just one character and work through their storyline and that's a draft and mm -hmm. I, as a thriller writer, I always do a suspense pass, I mean, many of them really, but but make sure that I have enough suspense scenes, that they're good enough, that they're working on a, a meta level and also on the character level of how the character is experiencing it, but also how the reader is experiencing it. Um, visuals, making sure that you have all the senses, you're using all the senses in it, uh, locational, structural editing, you know. So I I think I do dozens. I think I do. And and do you, do you show it to anyone while you're in that process or do you wait until you've got a version that you're thinking, I'm quite happy with this before you then then let others I have to it. be pretty happy with it before mm -hmm. I, I, I will talk through it before. Um, uh, sometimes, but, and I used to, when I was first writing both screenplays and then when I moved over into novels, I would be in writer's groups, writer's circles more where we would work through those. And I, I loved doing that. It's just, it's not very practical to do that right now. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I think, especially when you're first starting out, your first three or four books, it's really good to have people reading them. Now I have beta readers that are my readers, that mm. are readers who really want to, um, who are following the series and they want to have input into it. And, well, so, okay. and that's incredible. That's lovely. But I wouldn't give them something that it wasn't pretty near a book. Yeah, you know, I'll change I, it a lot, but I, it's not rough. When you, you started out, your, am I right in saying your Haunted series was traditionally published? And that was a kind of um, supernatural series. And then you made the switch into uh, self. You, you went, I don't know if it was in the Kindle store, but you moved into doing it all yourself with your Huntress series of books. Is that correct? Well, I kind of went back and forth. Yeah, the Haunted books, the first four were horror, um, more psychological horror were traditionally published. I did um, the first Huntress book of the, which is now a six book series. I wrote it and was studying self-publishing at the same time because I was alarmed at how little traditional publishers were understanding how to, how the ebook market mm -hmm. had taken off and how to price it particularly, that, that they were pricing 
authors way out of the market mm -hmm. and I had friends who were doing really well in indie publishing and I just thought and also the Huntress series uh was before me too when people started doing all kinds of vigilante mm -hmm. things I nobody was doing that when I started and and it was such a feminist thriller that I thought I would have a better chance I couldn't see my traditional publisher doing it justice. I just could not see that happening. So all of those factors made me think I would try. Um, so I did the first two of those self-published and really made a killing on them. Mm -hmm. And then Thomas and Mercer, which is the thriller, crime, um, mystery, suspense uh, imprint of Amazon Publishing, which is traditional publishing, but with a more ebook model focus, um, ebook and audiobook. Now, uh, they came and made me an offer for the series. So the third book on were um, Thomas and Mercer doing it, which was good because I was tired of marketing. So. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to ask actually about marketing because that's the, that's the big um, step for people that, that decide, right, I'm going to go down the route of self publishing. It's it, there's a lot of, you know, I think more than most people would imagine a lot of self marketing and you have to put a lot of effort into that's so almost as much as writing the book to make sure it finds a, an audience. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. It is. And I, I think, um, don't kid yourself. You, there's a lot of marketing involved in traditional publishing mm -hmm. too. There. So, you would not be doing some of those things. You would be translating it into the online version of them. Um, but I guess what makes it harder is that when I started doing it, it wasn't as saturated a field as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and and now, now is a whole different reality in every way. I have no idea what it is going to be the next thing. So it might be the perfect time to start self-publishing because um, traditional publishers aren't going to be able to get as many things in bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what falls out here. But, but here's the thing about anyone who wants to be a writer full-time or for the long haul, you're going to have to adapt to the marketplace a lot. You know, every, I would say every six or seven years, I have made a major change in the medium I'm working in, in, in the marketing and the whatever, you know, screenwriting to, to overseas writing, to screenwriting, to, to traditional publishing, to indie publishing, to, to Amazon publishing, to now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. is what I'm writing now is not a Thomas and Mercer book or series at all. I would have to do it from scratch anyway. I have to sell it in a different way. And while I was thinking very much of going to traditional publishing for this series because it's more historical and literary, now I don't know if that's a viable as viable an option as mm -hmm. taking my own audience and building on it in a more online way. Mm -hmm. which at at my stage because i've built an email list i do have direct contact with people who will who will buy anything that i write and mm -hmm. that's really key as you're building an indie publishing career mm -hmm. it's to have a mailing list that you control of people who are your true you know your true thousand fans in relation to just staying on the self-publishing thing I, I suppose one thing another thing that it gives you a chance to do is is write in different write different types of stories because um, I think if you're bound into a traditional publishing deal that's great for a lot of reasons but people expect the same type of book from you all the time and your publisher will tend to unless you're some sort of you know super name they'll tend to say no no you're you people want to buy this type of book from you so even if, if you write crime but you suddenly have a great historical fantasy novel idea they'll say no you can't do that because they 
the audiences won't transmit. So just write as another crime. Yeah, I, I, I know a lot of author friends that you would think they'd be able to publish anything that they want and they can't mm -hmm. for exactly that reason. But, but they're working around it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and how how were you able to build your your mailer list? You know, if, you, if you've got a thousand people on your list, is that just the hard craft of interacting with the audience constantly on social media, having a website, making it as simple as possible for people to follow you and to get updates on on your work? Um, yeah, it's if you're self publishing, it's really important to in the front of the book and the back of the book having. Um, a link that clicks through to a landing page to your mailing list. Um, and usually um, people do a freebie, you know, there's a story or the first book in a series that they're giving away or an old book or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so that every time they get to the end of the book, if they liked it, they'd be more, they'd be inclined to, to give you an email address if you're sending them something. So, um, and then, then yes, it's important on social media uh, to have a click through to a mailing list too, and just um, contests. You know, I have a, a I have a service that runs a monthly contest for me on my website, where people can sign up. You know, you have to sign up to the mailing list to be entered for it, and um those kinds of things all of those add up over the years uh -huh. just uh to a lot of people yeah mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you don't get that just from the follow on amazon or or facebook followers you don't have their direct if facebook shut down you know if uh -huh. yeah exactly shut facebook yeah. down um, <laughs> <laughs> uh then you wouldn't have access to all of those mm -hmm. people so it's important to have some direct contact with them and do you find is there is there any crossover between the people that read your books and uh, the people that read your your workbooks the the writing workbooks as well or are they are they fairly separate distinct audiences um i keep two separate mailing lists cuz mm -hmm. i don't want to bother yeah. uh, people with one or the you don't want to spam people i know some people are are all about sending all kinds of emails i think that's terrible <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you can... um you know i do it quarterly maybe mm -hmm. i should do it more than i do <laughs> but um but but uh there is some crossover because a lot of authors read my series um, and, a, and a lot of screenwriting and my screenwriting tricks, the, the authors and, and screenwriters on that list are smart enough to realize that, that if they want something from me, they're going to have to support my series. <laughs> whether they, and, and I have some really interesting super fans who just like me as a person. Mm -hmm or as a teacher and they're too scared to read my books or they're too, the Huntress series is, is very edgy. It's, it's, it's horrific, really. It's dealing with real crimes and, and heartbreaking crimes. And some people have been through it themselves and they don't want to be reading about it. And I'm the first person to understand that. So, um, but, but they'll, always buy my book and give it to somebody else you know so, so I suppose you're almost you're selling yourself as you know you're marketing yourself as a person not just yeah. your work but it's it's if you if you have an interesting stuff to say if you have interesting back and forth with people if you're a nice friendly approachable that's a whole other kind of aspect that you can that you can add to your to your list of things to sell it is totally and one of the things that you'll find is as writers is um People, people are usually shy to go on stage for their first couple of appearances and then suddenly the ham comes out and and there's a whole lot of uh, extrovert in authors mm -hmm. that they never thought that they had because 
we get to sit around and talk about books and story and characters mm -hmm. and crime and it's it's just such a great gig that we've got so we're readers as much as any reader and and yeah. we have a lot to say about all kinds of issues about reading and movies and stuff so and, and when you're writing books like the huntress books which as you say are, are based you know real crime books essentially you must do a lot of research into that i mean how 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 much time do you spend researching a book before you start telling the story well with the huntress book it, it a series it was interesting because i i had the when i finally got the idea um it came full blown to me however I had been, I'd been a screenwriter for a long time and Hollywood is obsessed with serial killers, just obsessed with them. So I've been hired for a lot of, I've, I'd sold some scripts that were serial killer based. I, I had, um, I was first hired to do a lot of rewrites on things like that, adaptations. And I do a lot of research anyway into police procedure. I just think that's, that's the kind of crime thriller that I like is has really specific procedure and, and accurate procedure. And so I started researching serial killers, um, FBI agents, profilers. I've interviewed dozens of them. I just sex crimes detectives and heads of sex crimes uh, um, all over the U.S. So I had done a ton of research that way way before I ever got the idea to do the Huntress books and, and that was all piling up. So I had, I knew, and this is the basis of the books, that women don't commit serial sexual homicide. They do not do it. They don't commit serial stranger homicide. And that to me is the most interesting thing of all. We see so many stupid pattern serial killer books that have nothing to do with the reality, reality of it. And the reality is, why don't women do it when we have so much more motive and reason to kill people all the time? <laughs> so, so, so I wanted to do that, you know, and, and say... The very clear and obvious thing about serial killers, which is that they are rapists who graduate to murder. Mm -hmm. That's what a serial killer is. There are mass killers. There are other kinds of, of mass killers, but women don't do that. Mm -hmm. So that was a fascinating arena to me and it made me angry. And I'd make, made a couple of stabs at it um, in a script before but then when the idea came, um, I already had years of research behind me. And I think that that's true about most books. When you finally, finally sit down to write it, you've been researching it for half of your life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of those things that have been nagging at you or they're under there like a grain of sand and that irritates the oyster and it becomes a pearl eventually layer by layer it's like that mm -hmm. so but um the other thing about research though for every book because i move around to different uh states and different jurisdictions in the u.s every police department every police jurisdiction is different and i always call locals and find out how it would work in their district because that's where you get the story gold mm -hmm. yeah. and cops love to talk to you and forensics people so why not it, it writes half your book for you I mean I was going to ask about that actually because it is something that you know I think if you're just starting out writing you might think people wouldn't you know it, they, they wouldn't want to be bothered by someone writing a story when they when they've got a job to do but you find that approaching these people they will they will generally want to help out. Oh, absolutely. And the, the first thing, well, in the U.S., this is how it works. I'm sure it's the same over here. There's a PR department that mm -hmm. you can call mm -hmm. immediately, and they'll put you in touch with the detective or the scene of crime officer, whoever you need to talk to. Um, and then going to 
you, just bloody Scotland, Lynn Anderson has been amazing about bringing in forensics people, and Craig mm -hmm. Robertson, my husband, was bringing over Catherine Ransland, who has interviewed just about every serial killer you could possibly imagine. <laughs> this is psychologist. Whoa. She's written dozens of true crime books, and she was going to be there at Bloody Scotland this year and Butte Noir. So there's a reason to go to these mm -hmm. conferences besides the networking um, and drinking, <laughs> so, <laughs> which seems to be the main reason we all go. But, but, and karaoke, of course, drinking and karaoke. Oh, it's karaoke. Oh, that's, I'm so, that's yeah. me. That was the final question we did. <laughs> and uh, would you say... Um, but would... no, they're... Yeah, the forensics are great. Uh, just on, on that note about conferences and things like that, would you say that these things, as well as for established writers, but they're useful for uh, new writers as well? Because again, I think if you're just starting out, certainly you can be quite, or a lot of writers will be quite um, introverted perhaps and not want to bother people that they think are great writers and things like that. But but uh, conferences like Bloody Scotland and stuff are open to that. And they're so friendly. Mm -hmm. Bloody Scotland is particularly friendly. Harrogate, um, I don't know. It's, it's, Harrogate can seem, I think, more closed, mm -hmm. uh, more closed. Bloody Scotland, I mean, I would think that. I'm an American, though, so, you know, I have a different perspective on these things. But compared to other American conferences and compared to Bloody Scotland and some of the other ones that I've been to, I think Harrogate is a, a little harder to crack if you're mm -hmm. a, a new author, where Bloody Scotland bends over backwards to have, have events for um, writers who are making their way up that ladder like Pitch Perfect is... I really strongly encourage anyone who's doing writing and hasn't sold yet to to go through that process or at least go watch Pitch Perfect and and it'll probably I I don't want to speak out of turn but I would imagine there's going to be some version of it online um this year so because it shows you how to pitch a book Mm -hmm. It shows you what agents think about it. It gives you the whole process there. And I know lots of writers who have sold and gotten their first agent through Pitch Perfect and, and uh, gotten sold. And that was their start. And blogging, meeting all the bloggers and maybe doing some blogging and reviewing mm -hmm. yourself is a really great path to publication. It's, it, it takes you up several rungs of the ladder that you don't really need to you don't need to sweat it you can kind of skip that and you guys are doing the same thing with your mm -hmm. podcast um you have lots of open doors from from people you interview mm -hmm. so everybody can do that kind of thing i mean i guess that's a bit like going back to the start that's a bit like being a reader in hollywood with the yeah. screenplay thing it's the same same sort of idea yeah yeah that's right anything you could do to just try and as much exposure, meeting with as many people as possible and making as many contacts as you can can only be a good thing. Yeah. And also, it's like a, a friend of mine, several friends of mine, because I talked to them pretty frankly about the kind of money that you can make at Thomas and Mercer, where a lot of people... <laughs> thought well it's it's basically e-publishing or something like well all right but <laughs> do you want a day job or do you want um you know a, a new house so 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 you hear really practical things about publishers and and what's going on mm -hmm. um and and how people sell and what the real you you make friends who can tell you, well, this is what it is, or introduce you to an agent, or all of mm -hmm. those things. No, definitely. And um, although you're doing the novels now, there's a link back to the screenplays, because I think the Huntress series is being turned into a TV show, is that right? It was bought for television, and I've done three episodes, and now nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> you know, it, it's... 
um, we're all in this incredible limbo mm -hmm. because it's not safe to shoot. Um, so I don't know. It, it's it's interesting because I have new interest in an an old book and script because it's so one one set. Right. Okay. You know, because. I've been reading and it's fascinating. There was something, I think it was, no, it was the LA Times. So you would have to have a subscription to to read it. But about the two, there's two test cases going on about how people are going to shoot, mm -hmm. um, how you go back into production safely. And one is in New Zealand, Stephen King's Children of the Corn. There's a new adaptation of that where they just, the, production company took over an entire village there and they're not going in and they're not going out right okay and and you know and they're they're enforcing different zones of social distancing on set where you have a colored band and you can't go outside your own colored wow. thing um wow. and and people are really treading carefully on this and it's most of the shows that you want to see this summer are not going to be mm -hmm. ready. They're not going yeah. to be able to shoot. So everybody is just reimagining what production is going to look like. So, so I'm writing my books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a very uncertain time. I was reading an article about I think it was the new Star Trek series and how they're it's all been shot, but it's the music the scoring of the soundtrack and. So what they're doing is every single person in the orchestra is having to record their little bit in their own home and then send it in and someone's having to put it all together. And it just, as you say, everyone's having to think of new ways to get around what would be a very normal process is now completely thrown out and smashed apart in, in this, in this yeah. current, current time. Yeah. I, I imagine there's a lot of uh, people have been digging around for screenplays like that one that was Ryan Reynolds in a coffin for the whole film or something like that. <laughs> 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 yeah, but even though, you know, that's only one aspect, you still have all of yeah. those people in production that you're going to, and it's really delicate because the insurance on, you lose an actor, you lose a director, you shut mm -hmm. down production and it's all, all of that money is gone. Mm -hmm. So just like businesses are having to, to weigh the costs of, if we get 25% of people in we're going to go bankrupt so i'd rather not open mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. yeah yeah get that capacity it's the same decisions being made in hollywood so so what is, so you say you're working on books what is what is next in line then what's what's next on the oh, well i i don't know i've gone completely off the deep end and i'm doing a, a historical set in san francisco right. with oh, all cool. real people all real people cool and I love it. I, I mean, it's, I'm totally breaking the rule. I have a whole audience of horror, mystery, crime people, and I'm just hoping that some of them come over and I'll get other people, but I figure I'm obsessed with it, so other people will be mm -hmm. too. But no, uh, that's, that's if I ever finish it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, but I, I love stories that have real real people or real events in the, in the past, you know, even if you're telling a story that isn't quite what happened yeah. and things like that, if they're told yeah, well, they can be brilliant. To it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are no Mary Sue's or Gary Stu's in mm -hmm. mine. They are all real people. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting any um, ringers in. So cool. I have to make it all work. Um, and they would have known each other, but the research is excruciating because mm -hmm. You have to read so many books on every person and try to figure out how that person came into their story. And, yeah. Yeah. And someone can be in a place where you know they were on the side of the world at that time and stuff. So it's right. It sounds like a kind of kind of like a, a jigsaw. You're slotting everyone together into into, into place. I feel that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and because it was more than a hundred years ago. Wow, really more than a hundred years ago. Um, it's not every date is accurate. It's like, yeah. come on, they couldn't have been there. You got to be kidding. <laughs> Artistic license, that's that's fine. smooth over the cracks there. Uh, uh. Yeah. 
well, lucky that uh, I can't go anywhere, so I have lots of time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. This is the time <laughs> to be researching something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the last book that you read? Uh, the last book I read was The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. It's it's devastating. It's a heartbreaker. Mm -hmm. So I read that yesterday. Right. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Yeah. And what was the last film you watched? Mm -hmm. We've been watching television. I, you know, we just finished Better Call Saul. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Um, season five. We're now watching Orthodox, which is also great. Oh, I've heard that's good. Um, is that the but the Jewish? Yeah, um, yeah. Group? I yeah, read yeah. the the not the book, but she did a series of articles, so I was really interested in seeing that. And yeah, when you when you have TV like Better Call Saul, it's really hard to watch a movie. But um, yeah, that is very high class show. Better Call Saul. I, I have to say, what was your thought? I won't give any spoilers away, but. The ending of season five, I loved the whole season, but I thought the very end needed a little bit more, didn't quite give enough for an ending. It was a little bit of a kind of sank yeah. away. For me. We felt that too. Um, it's it's staying with me. Um, and it, I think they spent too much time. It was it, w it would have been impossible to follow up that, what you know, the whole desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but um, it was really abrupt, Kim's decision. Yes. Yeah. And what we were expecting was, was such mayhem that when the mayhem happened in Mexico, instead of on this, on the Albuquerque side, I think it, it wasn't what anyone was expecting. So it was, yeah. and, um, and also just, my feeling about it is like, fuck, we have to wait for a year <laughs> yeah. for the next. I just I probably I longer what, now as well. In fact, probably longer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. So I know that, that's the that's the benefit in waiting till the whole show's finished and then just sitting down and just kind of binge yeah. watching all six seasons in one go. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but. Um, Right. I, I haven't thought of a movie that I've seen recently. <laughs> oh, that's, I that's I, fine. I, I guess I saw The Hunger Games I, again because I'm doing it. Uh, oh, right. I'm watching The Last Samurai and I did The Hunger Games because um, I'm breaking them down in my YouTube oh, series. Oh, right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So to break them down for Act One, they're they're great that way. Oh, and I did see Trolls with my nephew. <laughs> All right, okay. Cool. <laughs> I saw it four times because <laughs> they kept wanting to see it again. <laughs> so. I, yeah, I've seen that. I'm not sure I would want to watch it four times after. But... <laughs> well, there was very little choice <laughs> here. <laughs> So have you seen Trolls, Tarek? No, I have to say I've, I've spared. I've been spared even seeing it once to mind <laughs> 12 times or however many it was that she's seen it. Yeah, it's, no, I'm sure you've, you've seen it a few times. Oh uh, yeah, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, the, both the first one and the second one. It's uh, Oh, wow. I mean, on the scale of kids' cartoons, it's not the worst. It's certainly not the best. But um, I, I, maybe that's enough. Enough about trolls, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually I, th I thought that was a really a really great chat. Thanks to Alexander for taking the time to speak to us, and yeah. um, all that information about the technique and the three act eight sequence structure, mm -hmm. it, it was really useful from my own point of view anyway, in, in thinking about how to structure and tell a story. Yeah, it definitely made me want to sit down and watch a film and and see if you know. If that every 15 minute cycle of hitting to a climax starting again is there because i think it it's one of these things that, as we said at the start when she says it you think oh that makes total sense i can see mm -hmm. why there's, there's a reason for that and i can see why everyone's almost tuned in to enjoy media in that way so i think trying to replicate that in your own writing is, is something 
everybody should at least have a shot at. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a, a, at least as a baseline structure for your story. Yeah, um, yeah. It would be it would be useful to think about. And we've all seen things or read things that certainly don't follow that kind of structure, mm-hmm. and you, you know there's something about it that you're saying this is not working. Yes, it's either it's not working. Too slow or mm-hmm. it's too fast. But some reason it's a bit. Yeah, it's not clicking with me. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, thanks again to Alexandra for coming on. Um, next week, who have we got on, Tarek? Next week, we have TJ Welsh. He is an author of the Anna Undreaming books, uh, as well as a video game writer. He's a writer of the just launched Cloud Punk yeah, video it, game. Which has got which a looks lot. Really of, cool, yeah, yeah, it looks cool and it's it's got some pretty good reviews as well. And mm-hmm. He's got a really interesting story about how he how he ended up being the writer on that project. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, there's there's hope for us all. Exactly. So uh, we're not going to spoil it just now, but uh, yeah, definitely an episode worth tuning in for. Uh, before we go, we just wanted to say that uh, as we mentioned last week, we have started a new project that we're calling the Page One Sessions, where we get writers that we've had on before in as a panel and speak to them uh, about specific topics and also about the writing and stuff but but it's these are video chats that will be available on youtube and elsewhere and they're really aiming to be a sort of mix between the podcast and a sort of panel discussion that you might get at a book festival or something like that and we've already recorded yeah. one with tim levin and sarah pimbra that uh, will be available soon and next week uh, we're recording one with adrian j walker and laura lamb yeah, they're a lot of fun, and they're as Marco said, they're a little bit different. And I think you kind of get more of a sense of the authors as who they are, rather than just the fact that they write books mm-hmm. or scripts. And so it's 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 a really nice way to meet authors that you have enjoyed their work before. And also, of course, the main draw you get to see the ugly mugs behind <laughs> these two sexy tones. That's it, exactly. <laughs> Don't let that put you off, though. But um, yeah, if you, if you do have questions for uh, Adrian or Laura, uh, then please do. Uh, email us or uh, reply to the post that we're going to be putting up on social media about that recording that we'll be doing next week uh, at the time of recording this Uh, but it'll all be on our social media if you're interested in doing that Um, the only other thing to say is as usual it would be really great if you could spare two seconds to give us a rating on apple podcasts uh, and a review that really um, helps us climb up the ranks there and helps us get better authors and better screenwriters, etc., onto the podcast for you to listen to. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK Page One, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.